Hey, Pastor Josh here. Thanks so much for watching our videos. If you'd like more information about Legacy City Church, you can go to LegacyCityChurch.com. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell below. God bless you. Genesis chapter 22, and the title of the message is True Sacrifice, True Surrender. True Sacrifice, True Surrender. We're working through the book of Genesis, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, in a series I've titled, In the Beginning, God. Genesis, In the Beginning, God. This whole book is about him. He's in the beginning, in chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's the first sentence. He's in the beginning and he is in the end, and this whole book is ultimately about him working in humans' lives, saving the day over and over and over again. He is the superhero. He is the one showing up in life. It really is the story of our lives. We need our God to redeem and to save and to work in us, and he is doing that once again here in this chapter today. Today we will see God ask Abraham, yes, Father Abraham had many sons. He actually had one son, the song's got it wrong, uh, with Sarah, but he has many descendants, yes, Father Abraham. As many descendants as the stars in the sky, this Father Abraham will be asked to sacrifice his greatest treasure in the whole world. The treasure he had waited for, for a hundred years, his son, his only son with Sarah, his only child with Sarah, Isaac. God will ask him to lay him on the altar and offer him unto the Lord. Do you remember how long Abraham and Sarah waited for this boy? We, we looked chapter after chapter after chapter, just looking at them waiting and wondering about this promise that God had given them, whether or not he would pull through. Do you remember who Abraham was? He was not a Jew. He is the father of the Jews, but he was a pagan, a Gentile, saved by God and called to create the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation would come through Abraham, but he was raised in a pagan land, and God saved him. And God promised him that he would make his descendants like the stars in the sky. The only problem is they, he didn't even have a son that this would happen with. And so God promised him this son with Sarah, his wife, and they had to wait 20 years. She was old. He was old. And we saw Isaac born to them, Sarah in her 90s, and Abraham 100 years old. What a time to start a family, huh? And now God will ask him to take his son, his only son, and offer him back to the Lord. True sacrifice, true surrender in our text today. So our story picks up Genesis chapter 22. I'd like to read eight verses with you. Can we stand for the reading of God's word? We always stand to pay honor to him to remember it's his word we're reading and not mine. His word will change you forever. And it's always important to remember to look to his words above the words of ourselves and those around us. Look to his word. Genesis 22, starting in verse 1. Are you there? It says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son, his Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they both went together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. 
He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opening of this text. We pray that you would show us your message, your gospel, your good news. That we'd see your grace and your mercy. We would see the way that you build faith. The way that you build our trust into you. Right here in this text. Bless our time together as we study your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Verse 1 tells us that it came to pass that God tested Abraham. God tested Abraham. Let me ask you this. Does God test people? Yes, he does. God will test us to build our faith. What kind of test? God will allow us to go through trials and tribulations in life so that we will grow. Oftentimes I have found that I do not grow until I go through the fire of testing. Now, you're learning today right now. We're all going to grow in this text together, and that information will drop into our minds and we will have it. The real question is, will it drop into our hearts? Will the wisdom of the information come forth? Will we learn and grow? Why is it that many times the only way we learn is to go through the experience of it? Notice this. This is the way the universe is shaped. It's the way that it is designed. We learn all kinds of stuff, but it's not till we go through the process that we actually fully understand it. We have to experience it in order to gain wisdom. And that means that we have lots of trials to go through and lots of testing to go through in life. We don't grow unless we're tested. Point number one, if you're taking notes, God tests us to grow us. He tests us to grow us. Now, if you've noticed, but when you go through hard times in life, we cling to God more than ever. We pray more than ever. We seek God more than ever. And the most important thing is our faith grows more than ever. After we see the testing and look to God to be our Savior, trusting He has a plan and will pull through, that is when He ends up building us. He delivers us. We have then more faith than we've ever had before. We trust God more than ever before. Watch this. When you go through something, you come out on the other side and you see that God has pulled through, you then are able to trust Him more. And you go through something, and he pulls through. Then you are able to trust him more. And you go through something, and he delivers, and then you're able to trust him more. You look back on life, and you see how many times he's pulled through, and you're like, man, my God is faithful. He's doing something. He's growing something in me. James chapter 1, verse 2, the apostle James writes, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Did you hear that? He says, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Testing is an opportunity for growth. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you go through various trials. For God is growing something in you. Affliction, listen to this quote, affliction, like the ironsmith, shapes as it smites. The ironsmith takes a piece of iron, and as he shapes this thing into a sword, he heats up the metal. Then he takes a giant hammer and presses that metal on a giant anvil and starts to work that metal. And with great affliction, it brings forth a sword. It develops and shapes into what the ironsmith desires it to be. Afflictions are often God's greatest blessings sent in disguise. Afflictions. 
Lord, why am I going through this storm? I'm going to bless you. Lord, what is this test all about? It's a bit more than I can bear. I have a plan. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to build you. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to put faith in you that you didn't even know existed. I'm going to cause you to have more faith in me than you've ever had in your whole life. Trust me. Notice Abraham's response when the Lord calls for him to be tested. Abraham says, here I am, Lord. What a great response. When God calls your name, what do you say? Lord, I'm busy. Don't you see I got stuff on the calendar? When the Lord asks you, is calling you to do something, serve him in some way, minister and love another person, help out that family member, serve the church, give to those in need, is... Is it, Lord, here, here am I? Or is it, Lord, here I'm busy. Can you get someone else to do it? Do you remember that was Moses' answer? Moses, you're going to be my mouthpiece. You're going to lead three million people out of Egypt. Oh, no, Lord, I'm busy. Use Aaron, my brother. I got a problem with my mouth. I can't talk very well. I'm stuttering Stanley. I can't speak. God says, I made the mouth. You will be my representative. You're not too busy. I cleared your schedule. <laughs> Verse 2, he said to Abraham, Abraham, take now your son, your only son Isaac, your only boy, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering. Notice the language used to describe what's happening. God is speaking to Abraham saying, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Whom you love. I know you love him. I know he's your boy. I know you've waited a long time. I know this is your baby. This is a very sensitive moment. God is asking for his number one, his child, his family, his heritage, his blessing. Take your boy, look at the weight of the situation, your only son with Sarah, whom you love deeply. Take your family that you have with Sarah, all of your family. Take your only son you have, the son I promised you and gave you, the son you have grown to love. The love that a parent has for a child is very difficult to explain. Because it's not only years of life that a parent has given for their kids, it is minutes and seconds of every day. It is the thousands of I love you's. It's the endless hours of work and investment of time. It is too many special moments to count of those times with just you and your child. The little moments that mean everything. Small little moments. Any good parent <clears throat> would give their life for their kids in a moment. Parents love their kids beyond anything else in the world. And what if you, like Abraham, had been promised this boy and you waited 20 years for him to come and you're 100 years old now. You know the depths of the love between you and your boy and you prayed and waited for him and now the Lord will ask you the hardest question of your life. Abraham, I want you to take your most treasured, valuable, priceless possession and I want you to, listen to the text, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. What? Your most valued prize laid on the altar. Lord, you can have everything in life. You just, please just don't touch that can have everything, just not that thing, please. Not that position, not that money, not that relationship, not that child, Lord, please. You can have anything, just not that. I won't explain in detail what happens when you sacrifice an animal for a burnt offering, but it is not fun to read. To give you an idea, you cut it up and you burn it on the altar. This is impossible to hear. The request is too much. How could God ask for this? 
Abraham's ears must have exploded when he heard this. God is asking Abraham to take his boy whom he loves and offer Isaac as a burnt offering. R. Kent Hughes said it well. He said God was asking him to act against common sense, his natural affections, and his lifelong hope. Can you imagine the conversation with Sarah, his wife? Honey, the Lord's asking me to do this. What? This cannot happen. I'm not letting you go. did not make any logical sense, but look at the faith of Abraham. He moved without hesitation. Watch this, verse 3. So Abraham arose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and Isaac, and he split wood for the burnt offering. He rose and went to the place where God had told him. He gets up early. If there was any day to sleep in, it would probably be this day. You want to stay in bed. You don't want to get out. You want to stay in those warm blankets. You don't want to leave because you don't want to go and deal with this chaos. Look at the faith of this man. He trusted God without hesitation. He gets up early. The text says he chops wood. He pulls out his axe and prepares for a burnt offering. Imagine grabbing the axe and chopping wood. Your teenage boy is still in bed, sleeping. You have to go shake him, wake him up. Come on, son, we got to go. He did just as the Lord commanded. Why? We have to ask this question. Why would he do this? Is he just an idiot? Is he some just, just radical, you know, extreme, like faith? What, what is this? Who does it? No rationality, no thinking. I love this text. Watch it unfold. He must have known the Lord had a greater plan. He knew the Lord was good and didn't have an ultimate plan to hurt or do evil to his son. He knew the Lord would always redeem and always prosper him. He knew the heart of God. And he knew God had promised him Isaac, this boy, and that a nation would come through this boy. And so he had to have an amazing plan up his sleeve. He's like, if God is asking me to do this, he must have something super sneaky up his sleeve. Because he told me decades ago that I would have a son, and I didn't believe him, and now I have a son. He told me decades ago that I should leave my land not knowing where I'm going, and that he is going to establish me, and he did that. So if he's asking me to sacrifice my son, he must have something else greater in the future that he is doing. Many times we are called by God to trust his ways above our own desires. Did you hear that? To trust his ways above our own desires. Abraham's desire was to grow old with his boy, not to have to deal with this. But God had shown himself true in the past, and so Abraham could not help but trust God in the future. Watch this. If God is asking you to sacrifice beyond what you can handle, he must in return be giving you something you could never gain. He is about to bless you with something beyond what you could ever gain if he's asking you to give up something you have a hard time giving up. God will never have you go through something beyond his good plan. Did you hear that? He will never have you go through something that is beyond his good plan. The Lord is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. The Lord loves to give good to those who walk uprightly. And he always does. He will not withhold a single ounce of good from us. So if he's asking us to go through the fire, there must be some good on the other side that I can't see. You have to ask that question. Look at verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place off afar. And Abraham said to his young men, 
his guys. Remember, there were two young guys that came with him aside from his son. He says, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Watch as two things, two huge things to point out. Number one, notice, they arrive at the mountain. Here they are. Abraham, remember, he chopped wood. He got it all together. He got the donkey. He got two servant boys, young guys, to go with him to carry the wood and all this and lead the donkey and then his son Isaac. They get to the bottom of the mountain, and they stop there, and he looks at, he looks at the boys. There's a donkey, and he says, hey, guys, you stay right here. My son and I are going to go up on the mountain and what? Worship. We're going to worship. He's about to sacrifice his own son with his own hands, which would be the most difficult thing to do in life, and he refers to it as worship. This is real worship, family. Complete surrender to God. Abraham sees this as a full opportunity to worship the Lord his God. His act in obedience is worship. Life ought not contain merely acts of worship. Our whole life should be worship. Worship is not just when we sing a song. Worship is obedience unto God, running from sin. Worship is loving and serving our neighbor. Worship is laying down our lives for another person. Worship is studying the word of God. Worship is, yes, singing a song. Worship is our whole lives given unto the Lord. Abraham says, I will go and worship God in my trial, in my difficulty, in my pain. I will worship God. What perspective. The best thing you could ever do in your trial, in your trouble, in your pain is worship. Come close to the Almighty. Come close to God. Though this thing God is asking me to do is extremely painful, Abraham says, I will worship him in it. What an amazing statement. Can you say that this morning? In my pain, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to seek you. Remember Job? He says, it is the Lord Almighty, the Lord God who gives. And it is the Lord God who has taken away from me. And then he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. Job said, Lord God, even if you slay me, even if you kill me, I will worship you. He says, I have boils on my bodies. I've got this disease breaking out. My family's gone. My business is gone. My house is gone. Everything is gone. And here I am is sitting in this disease. And Job says, God, even if I die, I'm going to worship you. The medicine to your soul during a painful time is worship. He gives us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. Here it is, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He gives you a garment of praise to put on. It's a, it's a sweatshirt that says praise on it. He says, put that on and start praising me, start blessing me during your time of mourning that we might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he would ultimately be glorified. Notice after he says, the boy and I will go yonder and worship, he goes on to say, did you notice it in the text? I've never seen this before in 20 years of teaching. I have never seen this. Never. And it, I can't believe it's sitting there. He says, hey, young guys, thanks for watching the donkey. Thanks for bringing the wood. We're going to go worship Isaac and I, and we will come back to you. What? We will come back to you. You and your boy are going to come back to us? How can he say that? How can he say we're going to come back? 
Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. I want, to, want you to see some insight here. Hebrews chapter 11. We don't normally uh, Bible surf here, but uh, I do it quickly, but we're going to catch a wave over to Hebrews. I want you to see this. It's in the New Testament. Keep turning to the right in your Bibles. If you hit the book of Revelation, too far, right? Too far. Hebrews chapter 11. How could Abraham say, we will come back to you? Are you there? Hebrews chapter 11. One of the most beautiful sounds a preacher can ever hear is Bible pages turning. It's music to my ears. Hebrews 11, take a look at verse 17. Watch this. How did Abraham think this? It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Verse 19, Abraham, it says, reasoned. Abraham reasoned, I love this, he thought it through. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died and he had to sacrifice him to God, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Is that awesome or what? He says, hey guys, thanks for coming to the bottom of the mountain. We're going up to worship. And don't worry, we'll be back. But Abraham, I thought you were going up to sacrifice your own son. What are you believing secretly so deeply that God is going to do? He's saying, even if I have to sacrifice my own boy, my faith in God and his promise to bring forth descendants through my boy is that he must have a plan to raise him from the dead. I'm going to go up and sacrifice him and God's going to raise him from the dead. We'll be right back. I wonder if his plan was, hey, I'm going to go up there and do what God has asked me to do, and then I will sit there on my knees and pray until God raises my boy from the dead. Just amazing. Point number two, if you're taking notes, faith in God's future plan carries us through trials. Faith in God's future plan carries us through our trials. It carries us through our troubles today. Don't miss this. Abraham believed God's promise so much, the promise that his descendants would be like the stars in the sky, that it didn't matter what God asked him to do, he would do it because he knew somehow through this boy, God was going to bring forth millions of descendants. And God was going to keep his promise to him no matter what, because God always keeps his promises. And Abraham believed this. God promised me this, so he's telling me to destroy the promise. He must have a greater plan. Abraham believed even if he killed his own boy, that God would raise his son from the dead to keep his promise. That is faith. That is what pleases God. Believing him at his word. Have I not said this to you? Then why don't you believe me, God says. Did I not tell you I would take care of you? Why don't you trust me? Did I not tell you I will save you? Why don't you believe me? Hebrews 11.6, that same chapter, it says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Listen, do you believe God at his word today? Do you believe his promises when the bottom falls out of your life, do you have the faith to believe that God is going to pull through anyways, no matter what happens, so there is no need to worry or wonder? Abraham had crazy faith, but remember, where did it come from? The Lord had been building his faith over time, and I guarantee that Abraham is using the faith that God developed in him. When being 100 years old, it was impossible to have a child. The miracle came forth. He's pulling from that faith. 
He's pulling from that journey. He's pulling from that experience. I guarantee you when God told him, pack up your bags, leave your home, go to a land I'm not going to tell you about until you get there. He's like, huh? He's like, just believe me at my word. And he did. He arrived to the promised land, and God blessed him and multiplied him, blessed his land, gave him a son. He's pulling from all of that past faith and experience to bring him forth to this moment now. I'll never forget in Harvest Orange County, this is in Irvine, the church uh, that I was a part of, Harvest, for a long time, about 20 years, and, um, well, maybe, I guess, 15 years, but we're still a part of them. But they helped us plant this church, Pastor Greg Laurie. And Pastor Greg uh, was interviewing Pastor Chuck Smith uh, on a, I believe it was a Thursday night. And Pastor Chuck Smith, if you don't know who he is, he is the founder of Calvary Chapel, which has planted over a thousand churches, I think, on the earth. And um, Pastor Chuck planted Harvest with Greg Laurie, and that church grew, and they now planted us. And Pastor Chuck was there on stage with Pastor Greg, and Chuck at this time has, is in his 80s, uh, and it may be one of the last interviews he does, and, and Pastor Greg asks Ch Pastor Chuck um, about his cancer. He says, Chuck, we, we know this is hard news to deal with. We know that uh, you're now dealing with cancer in your 80s. Chuck all of a sudden starts smiling, and he starts laughing. And if you know Chuck Smith, he just has that like joy that just like boils up in him, and just he starts laughing. I'm sitting in the crowd just watching this old man laugh at cancer. He says, "You know." I've been through so many storms in life, and God has pulled through every single one. He's been faithful to me for 60, 70 years. I, this is just another one. It's okay. He's going to pull through again. That is an oak tree that has gone through many, many storms, standing there laughing at the storm like you're not going to uproot this tree, I'm not going anywhere. You can crush this body, but I have heaven. You can't take it away from me. You can't steal my joy. And that is the faith building of the past that carries us into the future. All of this testing being brought up to this moment, this greatest moment of testing in Abraham's life. Building faith is like lifting weights and building muscle. Once you build the muscle, it's time to put on more weight to be tested again. And then once you build the muscle, it's time to put on weight to be tested again. And again and again, you, you can plateau if you don't change up the workout, if you don't keep stressing out the muscle, and so you keep adding weight. And it's the same thing with faith. That faith is, is like a muscle, and it grows as weight is put on, and those reps and the muscle grows, and then it is tested again and again and again. And when you've been walking with the Lord for 40, 50, 60 years, and the Lord throws some huge weight on there to lift, know this, you have the ability to lift it. Because he has produced a faith in you in the past, and he has prepared you for this moment. You will lift it. The temptation will not overtake you. You have the ability you will be able to lift it because God has prepared you for this moment of testing. Promise Him. I mean, trust His promises. Trust the promises He has put in you. Trust Him. No matter what, He has a plan. It's just another rep. And I know it's heavy, but you will lift it. It is impossible and illogical for a man to sacrifice his own son with his own hands, whom he loves, unless God has a far greater plan and blessing coming forth. The risk is great, but the reward is greater and guaranteed. You can't lose trusting God. It's not a gamble. There is no gamble. Because he always pulls through. And he has done so for thousands of years. It's exactly what this book is proving. 
He has established his word to a thousand generations, and it will hold until the end. Abraham knows that the Lord will keep his promise no matter what. So he is willing to go through with the process, even though we are talking about a permanent decision like death. God is greater even than death, and Abraham believes it. The question I pose to you now is, do you believe it? So Abraham, verse 6, took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. Notice, Isaac just follows his dad. He talks with his son, come on, son, we're going to do a burnt offering, and he just follows his dad. We don't see any griping, any complaining. We don't see any hesitation here. Sons will follow their fathers. Daughters will follow their mothers. They're listening. They're watching closely. Parents have great, unbelievably great influence on their kids. And I hope the greatest thing that this generation, legacy, that we would teach our children is Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Be not wise in your own eyes, verse 7. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment in your bones if you do this. Trust the Lord. Do not trust yourself. Believe in God. Do not believe in yourself. Look to God. Don't look to yourself. Do the, just do the opposite of what the world is doing and you will win. Verse 7, but Isaac spoke to his father and said, my father... And he said, here I am, my son. And then he said, look, the fire and the wood. Here it is. But where is the lamb? Dad, I see wood and I see fire. And I know you've taught me burnt offerings. I understand the worship of God. You taught me this growing up. We've done many burnt offerings together. But where is the lamb? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. I love this. This is huge. Where is the lamb? Isaac was asking a question that has thousands of layers. Where is the lamb? And Abraham answered, God will provide himself a lamb. Something epic, something pinnacle right here, a high moment in the book of Genesis, something we can absolutely not miss. Right here in the book of Genesis, this is one of the pinnacles of this book, the high, the high point, the highest moment. Because it is a picture of the cross sitting right here in Genesis. The Bible has glimpses and pictures of the gospel everywhere, and today is no exception. The testing of Abraham's faith is actually a picture of the cross and the work that Jesus will do. The text says that God will provide for himself an offering, a lamb. The ultimate offering God is speaking of is his son, Jesus, his only son, whom he loves. The Father gave His one and only Son as a sacrifice for the sins of man, and God will provide Himself a lamb, and that lamb was Jesus. Point number three, if you're taking notes, Jesus is the lamb in Genesis 22. How do we know? John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, and he looks and he points to him and says, There he is, look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Watch this. We see Abraham promised a son, one son, his only son with Sarah. Promised to come forth, promised to be born, and this promised son was born. He actually came forth. 
And this promised son was born to do what? To go up to this mountain and to be put on the altar and to be ultimately sacrificed here in this moment. Now watch this. There was a son coming in the future called Messiah who was promised, who would come forth through a virgin. His whole purpose of being born would be to go to be sacrificed on the cross. Now you're ready for this thing to thicken even more? The same mountain that Abraham climbs up to offer Isaac is the same mountain that Jesus climbed up on, the same hill range, Mount Moriah is the same hill range which thousands of years later Jesus will be crucified on and bring forth salvation to the world. God is bringing forth a beautiful picture right here of the cross. Can we take it a step further? Abraham believes that his son will be resurrected. Who was resurrected? The Lord Jesus for our sins. He was the actual sacrifice, the actual Lamb of God who paid for the sins of the world, has brought forth salvation to us and who was actually resurrected. Just amazing sitting right here in the text. Jesus the Messiah is spoken about as a lamb who was led to the slaughter in Isaiah 53. He was oppressed, verse 7. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep that was before its shearers, silent. He opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and for, as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for their transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Verse 10 of Isaiah 53. Yet it was the will of the Lord, the will of God to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Abraham is not sure what God will do, but he is trusting that the Lord has a plan and will provide himself an offering. And God himself, God did provide the offering once and for all. When Jesus was offered as a sacrifice, when the Father offered his Son, there will never be a burnt offering ever again for all of eternity. Jesus was the burnt offering. And that burnt offering was made as worship unto God to bring forgiveness to our sins. It's amazing. A perfect, beautiful, mystical connection right here in our text. Verse 9 and 10 says, Then they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built an altar there, builds an altar with stone, big flat piece of stone, and he placed the wood in order, watch this, the text says he bound Isaac, his son, he lays him on the altar upon the wood, verse 10, and Abraham stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. Matthew Henry says this, having bound him, he lays him on the altar and his hand upon the head of his sacrifice and now we may suppose floods of tears he gives and takes the final farewell to his boy, a parting kiss. Perhaps he takes another one for Sarah from her dying son, kissing his boy. Maybe he even talked with him, dad, what are you doing? Don't worry. The Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. Son, you lay down. And the father asks his son to lay down. Allow God to do what only he can. We trust his promise. You know his promise. He's going to bring forth descendants through you. I don't know how, son, but I'm trusting the Lord. Please lay down. I love you, son. I'll see you soon. You can't help, but you have to transition now from this moment with Father Abraham and his son 
and insert Jesus right here, right now. For this is the perfect picture of what God the Father had to do with his only son whom he deeply loved. He ushered him to the cross. He sat with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And they had a conversation. Before he went to the, if it's possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. Is there any other way? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. The Father in heaven carried his son through the wrath being poured upon him for the sins of the world. God gave his son for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. This is the gospel. Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, he will not also along with him freely give us all things. John 15.13, greater love has no one than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. Romans 4.25, he was, Jesus, delivered over to death for our trespasses and was raised to life for our justification. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, church, the apostle Paul writing, he says, walk in love just as Christ Jesus loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant sacrificial offering to God. Jesus put himself on the altar and God the Father allowed for his son to be sacrificed so that we could go free forever. And there were tears on that day. It's the most beautiful picture, human representation of the gospel sitting right here in the book of Genesis. The perfect paralleled connection. Abraham going against all fleshly desires to save his son. He, he worships God. Growing his faith to the highest level he has ever grown it in his whole life right here. And in the very moment of sacrifice, praise God, Look what happens. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord called from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He says, yes, here am I. He says, don't lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for I now know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behind him was a ram caught in the thicket in its thorn, his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And, the Lord named, and Abraham named the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. God stepped in at just the right time. Abraham drops the knife, grabs his son, hugs him, and kisses him, and worships God. And they weep together in happiness. Abraham's so thankful he can bring his, home, his boy home to his wife who had waited so long for this boy. God steps in and stops a father from sacrificing his son. But we have to remember there was a time 2,000 years ago when a father did not step in to stop the sacrifice, but allowed his boy to take the sins of the world. And for that we are forever grateful. God the Father gave His Son, our King, Jesus, for us. The Lord tells Abraham, I know you fear me. You have obeyed me. You have passed the test. Your faith is complete and whole. There is nothing on earth that you wouldn't do for me. You have given me your whole heart. You have given me your greatest treasure. Just an amazing example of what God can do with a person if we would just let go and trust God with our whole heart. Stop hoarding, grabbing onto, this is mine. But to hold things your whole life with your hands open and say, Lord, I trust you. What do you want? What do you desire? Trust me, there are things in life, especially now with a little baby, and I'm just like, Lord, you can have anything. You can have anything. Just please don't touch that thing. But oh, if we can believe beyond that thing that God has a great plan and good to bring to us, how would he not give to what? Please, is he, if he has given you 
the greatest gift in all of the universe already, how will he not give you good things all the days of your life? He's already given you the best. God doesn't stop there. I love this. They're hugging, they're kissing, they're crying, they're weeping together, and all of a sudden, a ram shows up behind them. The Lord provides an animal. It shows up, and Abraham is able to finish the burnt offering and worship God. I love this. Are you ready? God asks Abraham to sacrifice greatly, sees Abraham is willing to do it, stops him, and then provides a sacrifice that costs Abraham nothing. He didn't even buy the ram. God just gives it to him. Family, this is our lives. The Lord is like, sacrifice this thing. You're like, what? He's like, lay it down. Give that up. Walk with me. Trust me. Follow me. And you're like, Lord, if I do that, I'll lose. The Lord is like, no. Look behind you. Caught in the brush. Provision is sitting right there. I have something coming. There is what you need. The Lord will provide is the, the language found in the text. Watch this. Listen to this. God is the one who provides all you will ever sacrifice for him. Everything you've ever sacrificed in your whole life for him, he provided it to you. He gave it to you. It is not even yours. God gave it to you. Then he asks you to sacrifice, and you're like, no way. That's mine. Because you don't believe he will give you more. And man, that's the Lord. He gives more and more and more and more and more and more grace. Over and over and over, he keeps his promises. He loves to reward those who diligently seek him. Abraham calls the place Yehovah Yidre or Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. The Lord, my provider. Trust God at his word. He'll always provide what you need. You don't have to worry. Family, do you believe God's provision and timing? Look at how perfect this is lined up. How many times has the ram showed up at just the right time? time you're like oh no lord you're not going to provide and he pulls through and provides and then he gives you all that you need and you're able to use all that he's given you for his glory what a beautiful picture huh the text closes the chapter closes with god basically saying by myself i have sworn these things and i have kept my promise and i'm telling you today there are hundreds of things that God has promised to his people in the Bible, and he will keep his promise. He has a perfect plan. We've got to trust him. This is only a test. He's just putting a little bit more weight on. But your faith is being built. You're growing. And he has a plan to strengthen you and carry you through all the days of your life. Amen?